Welcome to Staying the Course. Join us as we navigate the uncompromised Word of God with Pastor Brett Peterson. I love your word. I love the way it I love your word. I love the way. Welcome to Staying the Course. Join us as we navigate the uncompromised Word of God with Pastor Brett Peterson. I love your word. I love the way it... I love your word. I love the way... Welcome to Staying the Course. Join us as we navigate the uncompromised Word of God with Pastor Brett Peterson. I love your word. I love the way it I love your word. I love the way. Amen. That's a tough, I mean, that's a good worship song to follow, actually, isn't it? To worship his holy name. Wow. You know, I, I was just thinking that uh, Saul and I are playing basketball now, and clearly we are vertically challenged. But, and so, but when I was hearing that worship song, I realized I could do more than a two-inch vertical, you know, because you, you just want to jump up and praise the Lord, right? So I'd, I'd Pastor Brad, I'd get above that two-inch I normally get to. You know, in the military, uh, it, by regulation, you can't reach the rank of full colonel, you know, with a, the eagle a, until you're at least 35 years of age. And in biblical times, especially in New Testament times, you normally didn't start public ministry until you're at least 30 years of age. Right, Pastor Brett? And in fact, that was the age that Jesus Christ was when he was uh, baptized in the River Jordan uh, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, in the presence of the Holy Father and began his public ministry at that point. Um, for Hezekiah, though, God had a different plan. Now, it came about in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old. That's really young to be a king. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, and his mother... His name was Abby, the, the daughter of Zechariah. Hezekiah did right in the sight of the Lord. This is what made him a good king. He did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. Hezekiah removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent uh, that Moses had made. For until those days, the... Uh, sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. What a powerful statement that God has made about the character of a 25-year-old who leads so successfully as a king because he did what was right in the eyes of God. It goes on, it says, in, in Second Kings, it goes on, he says, For Hezekiah, and here's the message for us this morning, folks. For Hezekiah clung to the Lord. If you've ever had a little one cling to you, that's what this is talking about. Hezekiah clung to the Lord. He did not depart from following God, but kept God's commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him, was with Hezekiah, wherever he went, he prospered, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. And so the message for us as we enter into the new year, we begin a new book in Leviticus, is to cling to the Lord. To cling to the Lord, 
to do it his way, to do our lives his way and not depart from following him. Amen? God bless you. Happy New Year. Russ, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. Wake up. Come on. It's a new day. It's a, it's a brand new year, and we're starting two new books. Leviticus, that's such great reading, isn't it? Have you read it lately? <laughs> And Galatians with Pastor Chris Brunt. And actually, they go together really well because Galatians actually talks about the law. We're going to read a little bit about that this morning. But 19, or 2017, wow, what's the theme for this year? Who remembers? Devotion, wholly devoted to God. A new year, we're starting new books, Leviticus. The book of Exodus ended with the tabernacle built and God's glory filling the tabernacle. Do you remember as we ended the book of Exodus and we talked about the glory of God filling the holy place, then most holy place in the tabernacle. And that pillar of fire went up at night from there and then the cloud by day and it would go before them and lead the children of Israel for 40 years. Think about that. You ever want God to tangibly show you something miraculous just so you build your faith. You ever want that? <laughs> they had it, a pillar of fire for 40 years, supernatural, viable proof that God was with them. And yet, what did they do? They still doubted. Folks, I got to tell you this. If God sent you lightning bolts, if he spoke audibly to you, it would not change who you are. It didn't change who they were, and it wouldn't change who we are. You see, God is speaking to us through his word. You know, all 66 books are written by who? God himself through 40 scribes. This book is God's word given to us. A little tickle in my throat still. This is my parents' church. They go to New Hope up in Taft. If you're watching, there's a plug for your church. Oh, whoo. Anyone get that cold? This cough is just hanging on. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. <coughs> All right, had to do a good one. And now God is going to give the nation what they must do to be blessed by him. The book of Leviticus is actually a rule book. Any of you play any sports? All right, D did you memorize the rule book? You know, I played football. I never even saw a rule book. How did we learn? Yeah, the coach just telling us, no, hey, that's, no, you can't do that, can't do that, can't do that. It was in practice that we learned the rules. A lot of Christians are the same way. They don't read the Bible, but just in practice, they fall, they go off sides, they make mistakes, and somehow they learn because the coach, the pastor is saying, oh, no, you shouldn't, well, you really shouldn't, shouldn't we read this? You know, Leviticus is part of that, and we're going to talk about why we need to study Leviticus today. It starts right where we left off. God himself filled the tabernacle with his glory, and right after that, he is going to give Moses the regulations on what is holy and what is not holy. The regulations on how to engage a holy God, though we are sinful, wretched people. Maybe I'm the only one. Leviticus, literally a people devoted to God. Thus, it's very cool that our theme for 2017 is devotion. <clears throat> Genesis really set mankind on a path away from God. Do you remember when we went through Genesis? God created Adam and Eve. He gave them everything. Think about that for a moment. You ever wonder what the Garden of Eden was like? It was perfect. It was beautiful. Think of the most beautiful place on earth you can imagine. It was probably a million times better than that. They walked with God in the cool of the day. They gave glory to God and he gave them one rule. Guess, wouldn't that be cool? Instead of this whole book, you just had one rule. Don't eat from that one tree. Hey, every other tree you can eat from, but just don't eat from that one. Adam and Eve blew it. And from that moment on, we ran away from God. So God had to destroy the earth with the flood because why? 
The intentions and thoughts of every man's heart was wicked continually. The whole earth had turned wicked. It caused slavery and sin and death. Exodus really redeemed mankind, or at least the nation of Israel, his representatives to mankind, and set them really into the wilderness. And now Leviticus is going to instruct mankind on how to devote themselves to a holy God, how to engage God in relationship. Leviticus is all about devotion. And this year, I pray that we would all devote ourselves more to the Lord, dedicate ourselves and our home and our children and our spouses to the Lord. Chapters 1 through 15, just a good summary, deal with priestly devotion, specifics on how priests should act. Are we priests? Actually, the Bible says we're holy priests, a royal nation. And who's our high priest? Jesus Christ. Do you know this is going to reveal characteristics of Jesus Christ that maybe you haven't thought about? When we go through this, if he's the fulfillment of the priesthood, guess what? He's going to fulfill all these things. So we'll get to know who Jesus is a little bit more. Chapter 16 is kind of a parenthetical in the center of the book. And it talks about the Day of Atonement. You know, Yom Kippur, the Jewish New Year, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Trumpets, it's when really Christ atoned for our sins. That's our Day of Atonement. And we're going to talk about that. 17 through 27 deal with practical devotion to God. How we should live our lives, or how they, back then, to be fully devoted to God. What to do or, or not to do. Much of the book of Leviticus is devoted between distinguishing between that which is clean and unclean, that which is holy, and that which is profane. How would you define profane? You ever thought about it? Cursing. Cursing. It really comes from a French word that they got from the Latin profaneous, and it literally means pro, before or against, and phanum, temple or tabernacle. So anything profane is anything against the tabernacle or the temple, which represents what? God's presence on earth. So something that is profane literally is against the temple. We are now the temple of the Holy Spirit, so anything profane in your life is against the holiness of God that dwells within you, the temple of the Holy Spirit. So in Leviticus, things that are against the tabernacle, God's house on earth, are profane. Today we call bad words profanity. Do they profane the temple? Oh, absolutely. You know, our speech marks really what people think about who we are. And if you use a lot of profanities or God's name in vain, you are profaning the very temple of the Holy Spirit, God in you. That's why when I cuss, what do I say? Shaka pizza, that's my cuss word. <laughs> I hit my thumb, it used to be, I worked in the oil fields, and so, you know, they cuss like, you know, oh, my Lord have mercy. Every other word is the F word, you know, for most of these rednecks out there. And roughnecks. And uh, so it used to be when I'd hit my thumb with a hammer. You ever do that? I would think all kinds of profanities, a whole list. But I would just say, oh, shoot. Ah, ooh, you know. Now I say shaka pizza. You know, I, I, I would encourage you, if you don't have a good cuss word, shaka pizza is a really good one. It, it just, exactly. Shaka pizza. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Yeah, you can say that, too, because, Lord, you're really praying, God, have mercy. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Goodness gracious. Anything that defiles you as the temple of the Holy Spirit is profane. Are you with me? Leviticus is going to show us things that are an abomination to God, that profane, that are against the very expression of who he is on earth, the temple or the tabernacle, or now our body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. During our 10 days of fasting, I would encourage you, it's a great time, starting tonight after dinner, 
to get rid of profanity in your life. To do exactly as Pastor Chris in his homily talked about, clear out the temple, tear down the asterisk poles, whatever is profaning the temple, your body of the Holy Spirit and your thoughts within you to devote yourself completely to serving God. Ten days. I don't know about you, but have you ever fasted ten days? Twenty days? Thirty days? I've done it. You know what? I feel good once I'm four days into a fast. First three days are hell on earth. I want to tell you, if you've ever done a real fast for three days, first, first day, yeah, it's bad. Second day, it's worse, usually. Third day, literally, I can feel my toes, and they're like, feed me, I'm going to die. <laughs> now, medically, some people can't fast. And I, I understand that. God understands that. Do what you can. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But it's really a great time. What's our theme devotion? The pastors, the board, we prayed about it. We talked about dedication. But really, dedication is devotion. It's being fully dedicated to the Lord. Leviticus 27, 28 says, But no devoted thing that a man devotes to the Lord of anything that he has, whether man or beast, or of his inherited field, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy to the Lord. Do you know that you are precious in the sight of God? If you've devoted your life, if you've devoted your household, if you've devoted everything that you have to the Lord, it is holy unto the Lord. Why Leviticus, though? I so wanted to skip the book. Any of you praying, you know, can he, you just summarize it in one Sunday? And I, th I really thought, you know, I could probably summarize this book, Lord, in, in one Sunday, and, you know, we'll be done, and we'll move on to some better stuff, you know. Uh, hey, uh, you want to teach Leviticus, now teach Galatians? Okay. <laughs> Leviticus and Levitical law seem foreign to us in the New Covenant. You know, when we refer to Levitical law, we usually say what as Christians? Christ fulfilled all Levitical law on the cross. It is done. It is complete. We don't have to mess around with it. Many people despise having to go through Leviticus as they read through the Bible in a year. You ever read through the Bible in a year? Two years, five years, whatever it takes you. You know, and you get to Leviticus, and it's like you're just reading as fast as you can, and you're like, why is this even, why do we have to read it? it oh, oh, it's drudgery. It's a sacrificial system which is no longer relevant. Man, what else? It's a priesthood which no longer is in existence. We don't have to go to the temple in Jerusalem and go to a priest and offer our uh, unblemished lamb for our sins. No, all of that is done. And it's laws which are no longer binding. Paul on the law, he said this, Romans chapter 7, verse 12. So then the law is what? Holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Hmm. In the next verse, he tells us why. In Romans chapter 7, verse 13, he says, because, and I'll paraphrase it, this law reveals that we're sinners, that we can't obey the law of God. It points us to who? Jesus Christ. It reveals profanity in our life. And I'm not talking about just cuss words, but know this, out of your heart, your mouth speaks. Man, wouldn't it be great if your speech was always what? Seasoned with grace. Oh edifying, building up. It shows our need for a Savior. <clears throat> Why study Leviticus? Because it's going to point us to the cross, like that cross up there. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 5. And we will part the pages of this holy book. <laughs> what does holy book mean? There's nothing profane in it. It is wholly dedicated to the Lord. 1 Timothy, all the T-books are together after 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 1, starting at verse 5, it says this, But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart 
and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussions, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. What law is he talking about here? Not just the Ten Commandments. When they referred to the law, they referred to the Pentateuch, the first five books, even all Levitical law. Hey, the law is good if you use it lawfully, verse 9. Realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and the what? Profane. What's profane? Anything against the temple, against the the tabernacle against the church, we could say, against us as the temple of the Holy Spirit. But realizing this fact, verse 9, the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and the sinners, for the unholy and the profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers or murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So what does the law do? It's not written for the righteous, but who? The unrighteous to do what? Point the profane things in their life so they need a Savior, Jesus Christ. Leviticus will do just that. I love that God put it on Pastor Chris Brunt's heart to teach Galatians while we go through Leviticus. At first, I think you told me Ephesians, right? I'm glad, I'm glad God put it on your heart for Galatians because turn to Galatians chapter 3, verse 11 really quick. Galatians, it sounds like a, a sci-fi movie. Galactica, Galatians, I don't know. Any of you like sci-fi movies? Yeah, I, I don't know why, I love it. I was a Star Trekker guy, dude, kid, when I was a little kid. Watch Star Trek and dream about being an astronaut. How fun was it? How, well, that would be pretty cool. Joey said, that's why you're so weird, man. Woo. <laughs> Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 11. It says this. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. For the righteous man shall live by faith. What's that a quote from? Abraham believed God, it was counted unto him as righteousness. That preceded the law. So notice what God did. With Abraham, with mankind, he first introduced new covenant theology. Have faith in me. If you believe in me, oh, I will count you as righteous. They wouldn't have faith in him, so what did he have to do? For the rebellious, the unrighteous, he had to make the law, Old Covenant, which would then point us back to what he initially did with Abraham. <coughs> it's pretty powerful. Continue on. Verse 9. Or, I'm sorry, where, where were we? The, oh, verse 11, yeah. And by the way, if you go up to verse 8, it talks about Abraham and the covenant that he made with Abraham and Put, puts it into contest. Verse 11. Know that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. What did Christ say about these things? Hey, if you want to obey the law, you've got to obey them all. You'll be judged by that on judgment day. Continue on, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Does it say he redeemed us from the law? No, from what? The curse of the law, which is what? Death. Because we sin against the law, we get that curse, death. He redeemed us from that, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. In order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, what's that? 
the righteous will live by faith. It's a promise, not the law. Come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak in terms of human relationships. Even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it is ratified, <clears throat> no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ, the mediator of the new covenant. What am I saying is this, the law which came 430 years later, later after what? God's covenant with Abraham. That covenant was what? New covenant theology preceding the old covenant law. Isn't that great? You're righteous by faith, okay? Preceded it by 432 uh, years does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God. Boy, doesn't it seem like you're in court right now? Because he's making a legal case for faith. And he says, that was really the first covenant. Abraham believed God. It was counted unto him as righteousness. The law came 430 years later because the people would not believe and trust God. You see, being devoted to God in this year is to trust him with everything. Your job, your spouse, your children, the trials you're going through, it is to trust God. Don't be a stiff-necked and rebellious people like these people where God has to invoke law to get you to trust him. You see, in Hebrews, he says what? Those I love, I discipline. You see, you don't want that. We want the grace. Verse 18. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise, not the law. Why the law then? Verse 19. It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator. Isn't that an interesting verse? Angels, there's a council of 24 angelic uh, elders around the throne of God, and they make judicial decrees like they did with Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel warned him, stop your pride, stop your arrogance, or God is going to judge you. He will take your, your throne from you. The angels, the watchers, they said in Daniel, the angelic watchers, that council of 24 angels. And by the way, if you have a question about that, email me because I did, there's a whole study on it. The 24 elders are not men. They're angels. It's an angelic council that actually decree laws to protect God. Yeah, exactly. So what we have here is just a picture of that, that the law was ordained through angels. Why? Because they're looking at the covenant God made with Abraham, and they're saying, God, you said if they just have faith in you, if they believe in you, you attribute that as righteousness. That's what he did to Abraham. But they don't believe in you. They keep neglecting you. They don't trust you. They keep going their own way. They wouldn't enter the promised land. Why? Because of fear. They didn't trust God. And so the angels said, man, you need to do something else. And God allowed those angels to ordain the law, which is kind of interesting. <clears throat> ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator, and that mediator was who? Moses. Back then, Moses, in the Old Covenant, until the seed would come. Who's the seed? Jesus, who would uh, come, uh, the promise was made. Now, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> now a mediator is not one for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to, to the promises of God. May it never be. For if the law had been given, which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Nope. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to faith, 
which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor or our teacher or babysitter to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. And now that faith has come, we are no longer under a babysitter or tutor, the law. So notice the progression. God creates Adam and Eve in the garden. Hey, just don't eat from the tree. Man, we're going to have fellowship. You're going to enjoy what I created. You're going to give me glory. Like Michelangelo paints a painting and he gets glory because of the work that he did. So God created this world that we would worship him and give him glory. It was perfect. They failed. God said, what are we going to do? Hey, man, if you just believe in me like Abraham, I'll attribute that as righteousness. That's new covenant theology. And they couldn't even do that back then. So then he made the law so that we would see how profane and wretched we really were so that when Christ would come, then maybe we would believe, and that's why we do today. New covenant theology. It's pretty powerful and it's pretty profound. So why bother studying Leviticus? All scripture is important. In fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says all scripture, not some, is God-breathed, is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully equipped for every good work. Romans chapter 15 verse 4 says, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for what? Our instruction. So that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. First, First Corinthians 10 11 says, now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the age have come. I believe the church in the last days needs to study all the scripture, not just New Testament, but Old Testament as well. It's important because it clarifies and confirms who God is. The longest chapter in the Bible, who remembers what it is? It's up there. Psalm 119, right, is all about the wonder of the word of God. Psalm uh, verse 103 uh, shows us the heart of someone who really loved the Bible. He cries out to God and and he says this, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Isn't that great? Can you imagine him reading Leviticus? And he pauses. He goes, oh, how sweet are your words. You ever do that with Leviticus? I believe by the time we finish the book, you will say, wow, how profound are your words, O Lord. How sweet they are to my mouth. When David meditated on the law, he didn't just meditate on the Ten Commandments. He meditated on the book of Leviticus, the law of God. And he said this, my eyes anticipate the night watches. You ever do a night watch? Yeah, if you, uh, sometimes camping where there might be bears or wild animals, you have someone do a night watch. Indian? No, I'm just, there's no more Indians up there. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Canadian border. Yeah, you've done a night watch. Awesome. If you've ever taken an overnight sailing trip uh, anywhere far, you had to take turns doing the night watches. David said this, my eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on your word. You know, I've been getting up at 4.30 every morning, still doing it, right? 4 o'clock sometimes, 3.30 sometimes, but right in there. (laughs) And uh, now I, I almost can't wait because I get two hours of uninterrupted just me and God. Man, I can see where he's coming from. I anticipate the night watches that I might meditate on your word. Hear my voice according to your loving kindness. Revive me, O Lord, according to your what? Ordinances, that's what? Leviticus. Those who follow after wickedness draw near. They are far from your law. You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth, even Leviticus. Of old I have known uh, from your testimonies that you have founded them for how long? Forever. Huh. 
The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul, Psalm 19.7. The testimony of the Lord is, is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold, sweeter than the honey and the dripping of the honeycomb. Think about that. What did he know about the law that we don't? I don't want to read Leviticus. Are you go? Oh, come on, it's drudgery. What did David know about the law that we don't? Man, we're going to find out as we get into Leviticus. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Joshua and Leviticus. Who remembers Joshua? Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Jericho, did you ever sing that? And the walls came tumbling down. <laughs> I love that song. Joshua 1.8, the book of the law, what's that? The Pentateuch, all, all, all those. There, there's more in other books and rabbinical writings about, but close, yeah. There's a lot of laws. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have success. What is the new covenant teaching from this old covenant saying? When you obey God, he blesses you. When you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he meets all your needs. When you rebel against God, he holds back his blessings. He holds back what he wants to do in your life. Four reasons we need to study Leviticus. Number one, the concept of sacrifice. We really don't have any idea what real sacrifice is. Could you imagine if your favorite pet, when you sinned, you had to bring to church and the, and the pastors went out back, you killed it, and then they took it put it on the altar and just burn it up before, before God. I don't know about you, but I, I couldn't do that. Yeah, Rudolph, we could make rabbits too. <laughs> He's got a rabbit. We cannot understand the concept of sacrifice without studying God-ordained sacrificial system presented in Leviticus. We can't understand what Christ did on the cross without understanding the sacrificial system in Leviticus. What did he accomplish in his death? Believe me, sacrifice is for more than just covering sin in the Old Covenant. What else is there? We're going to find out in Leviticus. So much more. Jesus died and accomplished all of it, and we can only realize the extent of what he did for us on the cross by studying Leviticus. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we're told to offer our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, pleasing to God. We can't understand what a living sacrifice is unless we dig into the book of Leviticus. We're also told to offer up a sacrifice of praise, Hebrews 13, 15. We don't know what that is without studying Leviticus. Number two, the concept of priesthood. Leviticus describes the priesthood. Jesus is our high priest. We are also priests. So in Leviticus, we're going to find out what Christ really is as our high priest and what we are as we represent ourselves now as the priest did to God himself. Number three, the co concept of law. Leviticus focuses on God's law given to Israel. It's kind of like their constitution. Jesus said, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Is Leviticus... Valid 
and important for us to study? Absolutely. So we need to understand the law and we need to ask ourselves how Jesus fulfilled the law and in what sense these laws are still relevant to us. Are they still? Hmm. Number four, the concept of holiness. We're going to figure out what God means when he says I'm holy. Holy literally in the Hebrew is kadosh. And it comes from kadash. To be holy, devoted, set apart, sanctified, dedicated to God. Over and over in Leviticus, he says, you shall be holy for I am holy. Is that ever repeated in the New Covenant? Absolutely. And, And Peter, right? We come to understand the holiness of God and what it means. The concept of sacrifice and priesthood and law and sanctification and holiness are all central themes in the book of Leviticus. First Peter 1.16, it says, Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Quote from where? Leviticus. What does it mean to be holy? We're going to find out. You also are, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house and a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Leviticus, by the way, priests were from the tribe of what? Levi, Leviticus, is instructions for priests. Are we not priests? Should we not read the manual? Yes, we should. But you are a chosen race, 1 Peter 2, 9. A royal priesthood, that's all of us. A holy nation, a people of God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Holiness, priesthood, sacrifices, they're all there, even in the new covenant, because it's the fulfillment of the old. Yes. So Leviticus, let me sum up. We're almost done. Shows how God's people fulfill their priestly calling. It'll show us how we're priests. How they're led out of slavery and into sanctuary with God. How Israel must move from salvation to service and how we as believers must move from just simple faith in Christ to serving Christ and the church. Only blood sacrifice will pay for sins. It all points to Jesus. It shows that God's laws are good and for our protection. Israel must move from deliverance, they were just delivered, to real devotion to God. And that is what God is calling us to do in 2017. I believe this book will provide profound understandings of theological concepts that we've studied our whole life. Holy devotion. What better way to kick off our journey through Leviticus than our annual fast? I got to tell you, I feel good four days into it. I already said that. But I start trimming down a little bit. The fat starts going. My belly starts shrinking. My pants actually start fitting me again. You know, I can put the fat pants away. and (laughs) Now my fat pants are tight. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. But I found these ones. They're tight, but they've got like this, this stretchy thing, so it actually expands. Yeah, it's really, really a great thing for, yeah. Fasting. Ah, Matthew 17, 19. We know this. The disciples couldn't cast out a demon, right? And most manuscripts, some don't have it. Most say, oh, this kind only comes out with what? Prayer and fasting. Something supernatural happens when you fast and when you pray. The early church did it, Acts 13 too. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. How did God speak to them? Through prayer and fasting. You will grow closer to the Lord as you pray and fast. God is calling us to a corporate fast. Fasting produces a passion for Jesus. Do you know that? When you fast, you're denying yourself. You're looking to the Lord, and you're just getting all your fulfillment from Him. So tonight after dinner, we start our fast. Psalm 
Some can't do a complete fast. I know that. So just do what you can do. I would recommend doing a Daniel fast, and I'm going to read it. And if you have medical issues, please consult your doctor before you attempt any kind of fast. Does that make sense? All right. Teaching of Christ, he said, when you give, not if you give, tithes and offerings. When you pray, not if you pray, guess what else? And when you fast, not if you fast, meaning it's expected. If you've never done a fast, it could be a profound time in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. The purpose of fasting, to pray, to press into the Lord. The Daniel fast is simply this. If you can't do a complete fast, Daniel said, I mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat, and no wine. I guess beer is okay, but no wine. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) So this Daniel fast is, he just fasted from some things. Does that make sense? Whatever you can do, do that unto the Lord. Do a fast for 10 days. Press into the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll be here today at 4 o'clock if you want to join us for a prayer meeting. Our season of fasting and prayer, this is what Spurgeon said. Our seasons of fasting and prayer at the tabernacle have been high days indeed. Never has heaven's gate stood wider. Never have our hearts been near the central glory of God. This is what Spurgeon said to his church after he called an all-church fast. Now, if God could move in that church back then, can he move in this church right now? Leviticus, we're going to tackle it. And I think we're going to find some profound insights in the book. Amen? The people devoted to God, that's all God's looking for. And all of us here. All right, why don't we stand? If you need prayer, the pastors will be back to uh, pray. This is our theme song for the year, too. Let's sing it to the Lord. Strengthens and restores my soul, satisfies my need. Thank you for listening to Staying the Course with Pastor Brett Peterson. If you would like a copy of this message or would like to submit a prayer request or comment, contact us at 949-888-5777 or email us at info at ccbcu.edu. God bless you as you seek and serve Him. Remember, stay the course, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to Staying the Course with Pastor Brett Peterson. If you would like a copy of this message or would like to submit a prayer request or comment, contact us at 949-888-5777 or email us at info at ccbcu.edu. God bless you as you seek and serve Him. Remember, stay the course, and we'll see you next week.